My name is Kajsa Ekis Ekman. I'm Swedish, I'm a writer and an activist and I work for an anarchist magazine called Brand and I also write in the daily journals and um, criticize, you know, review books and things like that and uh, right now I'm writing a book about Greece and the Greek crisis but before that I wrote a book about prostitution and surrogacy so I'm here in this festival to talk about prostitution and uh, why I think the Dutch should change their policy on prostitution because right now as you know it's uh, completely legal to have a brothel and to buy and sell sex and so on because I consider as a feminist that prostitution is uh, against human rights and that it is a manifestation not only of patriarchy but of capitalism and exploitation of human beings. Most of the people are uh, thinking uh, that uh, if uh, prostitution is legal that ma uh, means like liberation uh, like the uh, yeah, I met many times opinion that oh yeah the ne Netherlands is so, so liberal uh, mm. because they have legal prostitution and so but uh, you think yes I think that's a very common opinion I'm very sad actually to hear uh, people from the left or activists who express this opinion I think that's uh, that's extremely weird if you think about the fact that they're generally against inequality and can see are very sensitive to oppression in other ways and cannot see here which is prostitution is at the heart of capitalism and patriarchy in a sense but I think you know the general problem when you look at prostitution as liberation is that you see it you equate it with sex and you think that prostitution is free sex whereas in reality it is the opposite you know because the way I see prostitution is that uh, in the prostitution contract if you for a second take away the pimps and the traffickers and so on you have two people right you have one that wants to have sex and one that doesn't and because one doesn't, the money comes in the picture because the first person has to pay the second person to do it. If both people wanted it, there would be no money. So even at that point, you have the inequality of desire, where one person wants it and one person doesn't. So I think prostitution in that way, it's the opposite to freedom of sex. Because there's a person there that doesn't want to be there, you know. And I think generally, you know, there is something wrong with a person that wants to be with another who's not interested. So I think that's the, what we have to change. I mean, the men who buy sex, that is the main problem. And it's not all men, it's a minority of men. You know, in Sweden now it's like 1 in, eight, one in 13. Uh, so it's a very small minority. In Germany it's like 1 in 4, which is a lot more because they have legalized prostitution. But it is still a minority. So I think that's what we have to change, the attitudes of men who do this. And if women were buying sex too, obviously that would be a big problem, but women are not doing that. Uh, why? I cannot explain. You know, is it culture? Is it history? Is it biology? Is it, uh, you know, what is it? Is it power? I don't know. But in general, where you see the people who buy sex are almost 100% male. Those are the ones that do it. The people that sell it, on the other hand, are 90% generally, something like that, women and girls, and 10% men and transsexuals. So you see, generally, it is a problem of men, you know? And uh, I think men have to learn that sex is something about a mutual desire. It's not something that he wants and can take or buy or get from a person that doesn't want it, something like that. You know, but then, of, of course, it's also a problem of capitalism, you know, where you see that... I mean, now this is a very expanding market where you have states that are legalizing prostitution because they want to collect tax money. And I think if you look at the Dutch state, it is in, a, in effectively it's a pimp because what the state does is that it will sell foreign women to tourist men. So it will take women from the poor parts of the world, bring them here or take them in and uh, sell them to the tourist men that come and take the tax money from it. So that is what a pimp does, you know, he's living off of something, he's living off of prostitution, which the state is doing. So I think this is something that Dutch people should uh, want to change. Mm -hmm. And the more the markets expand, of course, the more trafficking you will get, because, um, you know, some people think that trafficking is bad, but prostitution is okay. Have you heard this opinion? Like something like that, you know? And you have to look at why does trafficking come. It doesn't come because some men desperately want to buy only a trafficked woman. It comes from the fact that there are very few or not enough women who come voluntarily to the industry. So you will have to take them from somewhere. So you will go around the poorer countries and vacuum clean the countryside for young women who unwittingly 
join this man to work in something like cleaning or babysitting or maybe they even know it's prostitution but they don't know what it really is about. So that way you will feel the demand for constantly new women and girls. So you will have to accept the fact that if you have a sex industry, if you make it legal, if you allow it to expand, you will have trafficking as a consequence. You cannot avoid this. Because in a rich country, there simply aren't enough women to fill this demand. In Sweden, we do have a law that fines uh, the men who pay for sex because we consider it uh, actually a crime. Um, this law has been working very well. As I said before, like one in eight Swedish men used to pay for sex and now it's one in 13. So you see it has gone down a lot. You see it's working. We have a lot less prostitution than, than other countries. Uh, actually, what did happen was that the traffickers, the Nigerian mafia especially, started going through Sweden and going to Norway. So they all ended up in Oslo and the, the capital of Norway. There was a big uh, problem with this. So Norway said, what are we going to do? And they now they also have the Swedish law. So I think it shows that this thing is working. Now, if you're an anarchist, you can say that you're against law as a tool of changing people's behavior. And I can see the point in that. The problem is that I'm not going to fight against the few laws that are actually creating social justice, and this is one of them. You know, I think if you want to have a perspective about uh, laws as being bad, you can have it on the philosophical uh, terms, you know, and start talking about it. But you're not going to focus on the laws about, you know, you, you can't beat your, up your children, you can't rape someone, you know, you can't kill someone, and you're going to say, oh, we're going to take away these laws. No. I mean, that's not the first law we're going to take away. And I think now that we're living in a society that regulates, th regulates things through law, I think this is a very good measure. Because, as of course, as an anarchist collective, you can do a lot of other things to fight prostitution. You can spread opinions. You can uh, do consciousness raising among the people that you know. You can have direct action against uh, brothels, against strip clubs, you know, against all these things. And you can, you know, posters, whatnot. All these things you can do. You can provide support to people who want to exit prostitution. But if you look on the whole perspective, you know, the anarchists aren't that many so that they can change the prostitution culture of a whole country. So I think in that respect, the Swedish law has been working very well because it doesn't matter where you are in the country, when you pay for sex, if they discover you, and they often do, you will be, pay, you will be paying a fine. You see, so, I mean, for, for the typical husband who has two kids and a good job, you know, and will, like, go to a prostitute after his working day, he doesn't care about what an anarchist thinks, but he cares about what the law thinks, thinks, and he won't do it if he knows that he can be getting in trouble. Do you think uh, prostitution is also affecting all society? Definitely. Could you? I mean, ideologically and practically and in relationships, you know, first you have the thing that trafficking is now causing, which is uh, a lot of um, drug and mafia and weapon related crime that has to do with this thing. Uh, then on a relationship level, because I think it distorts relationships between especially men and women, that men think that they should pay to be with a woman, you know? I mean, I think that's generally like... Uh, you know, not my idea of a good relationship between men and women, that you're going to pay each other. I think they should be with each other because they like each other, right? And, um, I mean, but I think the most important thing about prostitution is that life in prostitution for a woman who is in there is very hard and often very short. That, um, I think it was an American study that showed that women in prostitution have a 40% higher mortal rate than women who are not in prostitution, that the, they are killed 18 times more than, uh, than women outside prostitution. Uh, the levels of violence against uh, women in prostitution, for example, are very high. So life in prostitution is very hard and uh, it's not an ideal life for anyone. You might be lucky that you can escape it if you're there for a couple of years and you don't get subject to the worst violence, maybe you can escape it and you can live a good life after that. But a lot of people get also harmed psychologically. And I think, uh, you know, when I was having this speech now, there was one woman in the audience who said that well, you know, prostitution is one thing that we can have, but the violence is another thing and we don't want this. Now, I don't think you can separate these things, because if you see prostitution and it where it comes, 
it will be associated with violence and things like that because the buyers will think, because I'm paying for her, I can do whatever I want. So he's already looking at her like someone who he's bought and we can like hit or abuse or subject to things that, that he feels like doing. Do you see my point? So I think if you're talking about prostitution, the main thing isn't to talk about ideology. It's to talk about the real practical things that happens. You know, it is a matter of life and death. And I mean, you have to think, okay, is it worth so damn much for these men that they have to get the right to buy sex, that we can sacrifice women's lives, that we can sacrifice children, you know, that we can make lots of women's life, lives a miser misery? Because these men have this God-given right to buy sex? I mean, no. We're not forbidding them to have sex in general. We're just saying, don't pay for it. I mean, don't pay for it and a lot of misery would disappear. They can sleep with anyone, but if the other person wants it. I mean, is it so difficult? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It is not so damn important. I mean, it's like everybody's rushing to protect these men's goddamn right to pay for sex. Like it's a sacred part of the Ten Commandments. I mean, please, it is not that. I have lived a whole life and I've never paid for sex and I'm perfectly happy. And I think most of us have lived a whole life and we haven't paid for sex and we're okay. Yeah, I think it makes uh, even uh, people worse uh, when they do. Uh. Yeah, you know, we have a line in Sweden that you can call if you're a sex buyer. And you can call this line, like, uh, if you have problems with it. And what I have heard from the people answering the phone at this line... Those people have problems with it. Like, yeah, well, I mean, they call mm -hmm. and they say, Oh, I am, like, in hell. My marriage is in hell. I can't stop paying for sex. I go to prostitutes. I am... And, you know, a lot of them, they have guilt feelings. They have a very mixed up psychological dilemma, you know. I mean, for a lot of them, it's not just like they go there and they come back and they're happy, you know. Maybe it's also the ones that are calling this line that have problems, but a lot of them, they express like serious psychological dilemmas. So I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, people think that, okay, the men who buy sex are handicapped men, they, they can't get it otherwise. You know, this is not true. This is not true at all. Most men who pay for sex, they are like, they, they, they're already married. They have a woman at home, you know? Um, even it's men who are like, even the average good looking guy, you know? So it's, it's also about power, you know? It's not about the poor man that can't get anyone, you know? It's even more common that the prostitute will be a handicapped girl than that the buyer will be a handicapped man. Why? Because if you're handicapped as a girl, either physically or mentally, it means that your ability to say no and to leave is restricted. So it will be easier for someone to manipulate you into being in prostitution. Like we had a case in Malmö, in the south of Sweden, where there was a girl, she was 14 years old, and she was like mentally handicapped. So her friends, okay, friends now, look at this, they thought we can make money off of this girl. So they took her and brought her to like public toilets where she would sleep with all these men and the friends, friends would take the money. Do you see? And you wonder, first of all, what kind of friend is this? And second of all, the men who are paying for this, they know that this girl isn't some kind of a entrepreneur, 23 years old, like with an academic degree that chooses this. No, they know perfectly that it's, uh, you know, a handicapped girl who's being manipulated by her friends and they anyway buy it. So when people are telling me like, these girls, they're independent, they know what they do. Come on, okay, look at all the men who don't give a shit about that the girl knows what she's doing or not. Because they can perfectly think of sleeping with somebody who's handicapped, who's young, who's being trafficked and all that. What people can do to stop it? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think you can work in a lot of ways. I think uh, in the Netherlands and Germany especially, I mean, you have to abolish the pimp state. You have to say that we don't want the state to be a pimp. You have to say the tax money that is coming from prostitution, I don't want it. I mean, if the general public is taking tax from prostitution, I mean, does this feel good? I wouldn't feel good, you know? I wouldn't feel good knowing that, you know, because uh, some uh, woman from uh, Africa, Latin America or whatnot is uh, standing in a shop window in the red light district sleeping with hordes of British men who are coming to uh, celebrate that one of them is getting married and so on you know I wouldn't be happy knowing that 
I am going to hospital and I'm getting my medicine from this. No, I wouldn't feel good about this. So I think definitely there should be a change in this, that uh, this policy has to be changed. There's two, two ways into prostitution if you generalize very much. I mean, first you have the economic uh, reason, which is uh, women who are from very poor countries and who might not have an other option, who might not have papers, for example, and can work, and prostitution is the way to survive, you know? Then you have the prostitution that we get in rich countries, uh, which is uh, girls who have been abused by their parents, by their fathers, or have a kind of history of sexual trauma who will get into prostitution, not for the money, but to deal with their own trauma. Do you see what I mean? They don't need the money. Even there are cases where they have taken the money and they hate this money, so they put it in the toilet and they flush. They don't even want it, do you understand? It's dirty money, they hate this money. They're doing it to hurt themselves, you know? It's like a lot of women, you know, they cut their... It's self-destructive behavior, do you see? So, but in both cases, I think for the man who's abusing them, I mean, there, there's no excuse to abuse somebody who's either so poor that she doesn't have another option. I mean, give her the money anyway, but don't sleep with her because she obviously doesn't want you. Or second of all, using somebody who obviously has a trauma and who would need to get over the trauma in therapy or something like that, you know, don't make it worse. What kind of person are you if you do that? So what can we do to help? I think that's a big discussion. I mean, first of all, I think there should be definitely exit programs, exit centers, because a lot of money is being spent on the wrong things. The European Union, as I was saying in my speech, they give a lot of money every year to an organization called TAMPEP, who is a Dutch-founded organization, who, uh, which uh, goes around in uh, Holland and in Eastern Europe and distributes condom condoms to prostitutes and they also give out leaflets about how good it is that prostitution is legalized you know and that it should be legalized all over Eastern Europe and they're very active in Eastern Europe trying to legalize prostitution there so I went to interview them and I asked them why don't you spend some of this money on getting girls out because the woman who's working there she told me that sometimes she will go to one of these streets uh, she's Polish, by the way, and she says that a lot of the women are Polish, too, and she says that it's so good because then I can speak to them. And she says that sometimes there's a girl, she comes, she's 18, she hasn't even had the first client, and I tell her how to put on the condom. And I say, man, is that what you're telling her? Why don't you tell her, do you need something? Maybe you don't want to be in this, do you want a house or do you want a, a job? Can I help you with something? You know, don't teach her how to put on a condom, man. And the woman goes, no, we're not helping them to get out. Why would we do that? She says, we're helping them to be good prostitutes. Do you get it? And this is EU money that goes to this. You know, EU has a lot of money. And why does it go to this? Because they don't want HIV to be spread, so they're going to give condoms to prostitutes. They don't care about the prostitutes. It's about this. But if you were going to give some of this money to programs where you could say, okay, maybe you're in trouble in your life, Okay, we will help you to get an education, to get maybe a place to stay and to get a job, something like that. And you're not going to force the women, you're not going to go and take them and drag them into the program. You're going to go on these streets and you're going to say, excuse me, does someone here want to be in this program? You know, and see if somebody's interested. And I think, yes, a lot of people would be interested. What is uh, motivating you that you uh, talk about this subject uh, so enthusiastically? <laughs> because I'm generally angry. <laughs> no, you know what? It's like... Okay, it's um, different things actually. I mean, when, when I started writing this book because I wrote a book on the topic, it was because I was living in Barcelona and I was living with a girl that was in prostitution and she passed away a couple of years later. And what I have seen, I mean, if you have seen what I've seen, there's no way back. Do you understand? There's no way you can tell me that this thing is okay and paint it in pink because I know what's behind. Okay, I've seen this. So, I have other friends too that have been in it for different reasons and I also know men that have been paying for sex and so on and uh, generally I tell them, you assholes, fuck off, okay? But um, also I think it's a, for me it's a thing of women's rights and about equality between men and women generally, you know. I don't like to have a world where women are sold and bought like cattle and men are just going there and, and don't care. You know, one thing I will tell you about Thailand I was in Thailand too, and their sex industry is very big. So, uh, women and girls and young boys are being sold in masses to these tourist men. Now, 
the men in Thailand, what do they do? They also buy sex. They also buy it themselves. So instead of standing up for the women in their own country and saying, we don't accept that you tourists will come here and, and, and buy them like they were animals, we're saying no to this. No, they are going and they're buying, they're paying for it themselves. I mean, it's a very big proportion of the, of the men in Thailand that also pay for sex. So I think, you know, it shows a general hypocrisy on a lot of men. I'm not saying all of them because there are a lot of men also that would support women's rights. But that if you come to a poor country and you say, I will take the minerals, I will take the oil, I will take uh, the diamonds, or I will take the whatnot of your country, the men will say, no, you colonialist, go away. But if they want to take the women, the men will say, oh, okay, I will drive you to the brothel and I will go there too. Okay, do you see? So this thing, I think, is something that, look, if men were a bit more active in the women's rights question, we wouldn't have the problem of prostitution and rape and things like that in the world. So, in a sense, I'm a bit cynical about why I have to have this struggle. I'm a woman, you know. I think this is not a woman's thing, it's a man's thing because men are the ones that are paying for sex, so they should be the ones that should actually run this struggle. And talk, don't come to the women and say, oh, I'm such a good man, I'm fighting prostitution. Go to the other men and say, did you pay for sex? Why are you doing this? It's no good. You know, if they would talk to each other, I think we would have a change of attitudes. Because, you know, in some countries, like, in some countries, the men will tell each other, I've been to prostitute, and they will go, cool. No, this has to change. It has to be, what? You know, when you get that response, they will not be like, yeah, cool. They will be like, what? Then you've succeeded.